Comprehensive, relevant, and insightful conversations about health and medicine happen here on MedStar Health Doc Talk. Real conversations with physician experts from the largest healthcare system in the Maryland, D.C. region. March is Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. Did you know that colorectal cancer is the second leading cause of cancer deaths in the United States in men and women combined? Having accurate facts about colon and rectal cancer is very important. Whether you're reporting on a story, doing a homework assignment, or raising awareness with family, it's important to know the colon cancer signs, symptoms, and risk factors. Welcome to MedStar Health Doc Talk. I'm Ryan Miller, and I'll be your host for today's episode. Today, we're focusing on colon cancer, everything from symptoms, stages, causes, and treatment. We are here with Dr. Priyanka Kant, the director of the Gastrointestinal Cancer Prevention Program at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital. Dr. Kant sees patients and families with high risk for gastrointestinal cancers. Her area of special interest and expertise is gastrointestinal cancer, especially hereditary colon cancer and colon cancer prevention. Thank you for joining us on MedStar Health Doc Talk. Thank you, Ryan, so much. I'm uh, very excited uh, to be here today, and thank you for inviting me. We're uh, thrilled to have you weigh in on these topics. So can you tell us how you ended up choosing a career in gastrointestinal cancers, and what is your role in helping diagnose, treat, and manage them? Yeah, uh, I would say it was almost by chance. Uh, So I knew I wanted to do GI when I was doing internal medicine. That is because I had worked in GI research. But cancer, uh, funny enough, I was an intern medical resident, and I was looking for a project. And I ended up um, with um, a project on uh, precancerous colon polyp. Uh, This is the area I work really heavily into, something called serrated polyps. And I started working on that, and I could actually review the patient charts, but also looked at the histopathology slides for these fascinating polyps. And I was like, this is so uh, interesting, like how polyps turn into cancer. And that was, I think, the beginning of me, like, I want to dedicate myself into this area. So I would say it was by chance, but I love it, what I do. And it is, most of my work is in precancerous colorectal polyps. And these polyps are the one where GI prevention really comes. Um, Most of our work is in this area. So as gastroenterologists, uh, our biggest role is in prevention. The way it happens is we can truly prevent colon cancer by removing these precancerous colon polyp. These are this little growth in the colon that can turn into cancer. And colonoscopy is a process where we can find these polyps and remove them. So this is one of the those cancer where you can truly remove precancerous lesion and prevent it from turning into cancer. So that's one of the biggest role of any gastroenterologist in practice, and we do this daily. But we can also help in um, managing them. If somebody gets cancer, they go through treatment. And after treatment, they also need frequent surveillance, and that's where our role comes back again. So it's more um, pre and get the cancer treatment done and then post again. So we are involved throughout the process of, I would say, colon cancer uh, detection and also prevention, and then maybe post-treatment. And it sounds like you all take a comprehensive approach at the gastrointestinal cancer prevention program at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital. Can you talk about that team aspect? Absolutely. So the GI cancer prevention program is for patients who could be at a high risk for developing not only colon, but other GI cancer. And one of the ways um, this program helps is to identify these patients. So uh, if you are at a high risk, if you know you have family history and is suspicious, we um, pursue genetic testing, genetic evaluation and testing, and we can truly identify a gene alteration. That is not always an explanation for someone to develop cancer. That explains maybe 10 to 20 and up to maybe 30% in young patients. But we can truly identify these patients who may not have cancer, but are carrying a gene alteration that we can find and put in all these preventive strategies way earlier than we would have otherwise known and not wait till cancer develops. So that's one of the biggest aspects of doing a high-risk cancer prevention And then following these patients uh, along with their family members. So if you find somebody who carries a gene mutation that increases their risk of colon cancer, 
we can also test their family members who could be at risk. So it's not only treating them, but treating the whole family. And that is one of the biggest goals of this program. The other things we do is we follow these patients more on a long-term, like lifelong ba basis in terms of a continuity of care. So for example, there is a condition called Lynch syndrome, which is very prevalent, one in 300, and it increases your risk of colon cancer up to 50 to 60%. But if we know you're carrying this gene mutation, we start early colonoscopy by age 20, by age 30, rather than age 45, which is now the average risk uh, screening. So knowing that is the first step. And we know that we can prevent cancer and we can also detect in family members. So saying that this is, um, I also wanted to point out, say Lynch syndrome also increases risk of many other non-GI cancers. So a lot, of the, a lot of time, this is quite overwhelming for patients to go to different physicians and not able to have a comprehensive care at one point. Our clinic provides that care, that you can have a continuity of care that goes over not only your GI care, but all other care, and try to find the best possible resources and most updated recommendation that can help you prevent and manage your cancer. That's really encouraging to hear, and it sounds like you all and your team are along every step of the way with these patients. So even after they're cancer-free, you'll still be following up with them in the years to come. Absolutely. So we do uh, work very closely with the oncologists, with colorectal surgeons. We see patients with pediatric gastroenterologists, uh, pathologists, radiation oncologists. So we have a very good team where we... Um, we communicate, we see these patients, um, and then follow these patients along. And after the treatment, they, if they need GI screening, we follow them, I would say, lifelong. You guys are always there when they need you. Absolutely. My next question is, what are some common colorectal cancer symptoms or signs that it's time to see a doctor? Also, can family history be a risk factor? Yeah, absolutely. So just to be aware that colon cancer may not present symptoms. So that is always there. Like it's a cancer that may not have any symptoms. But we absolutely want you to be aware that some symptoms could be red flag. And uh, some of these things we look at are if you have blood in your stool, it's a big, very big red flag, something which we cannot explain um, and not ignore it. Like, say, a young patient comes in and it's, it's not always hemorrhoids. So we want to investigate that uh, till we find what could be the root cause of it. Similarly, other GI symptoms like change in bowel habits. So if somebody was very regular and now suddenly you have diarrhea or constipation for weeks and you can't explain it, those are the things we want to hear about. But even other things like abdominal pain or you're losing weight, you don't want to eat, things that you can't explain and cannot find the reason over a few weeks, you want to talk to someone, maybe a primary care doctor, maybe a GI doctor. But these, these are the uh, patients who have symptoms and we don't want to um, not find a cause. And these are the ones I would highly recommend they seek care. Family history is a great question because this is my um, area of work where I always encourage my patient to ask about the family history. Having a family history of colon cancer or even other cancer, and more specifically, if you have cancer of any kind that happened in a young family member, is highly concerning for could be a genetic cause or even otherwise. So if you have certain family history of patients with one cancer or many cancers or young onset cancer, do talk to your primary care or uh, whoever you see, a provider, because you could be carrying a gene mutation or you could qualify for early screening. So if you're experiencing any of those symptoms you discussed, you need to be proactive about it and not wait. Absolutely. So do not wait um, and ignore these symptoms because these could be signs of uh, cancer or early, and we want to catch them early because as soon as we find them, so the earliest stage, say if, if somebody has cancer, the earliest stage of colon cancer is uh, easily treated as compared to somebody who has more progressed uh, cancer stage. That makes sense. Uh, thank you for that explanation. Dr. Kahn, recent data from the American Cancer Society shows that colon cancer is now the leading cause of cancer deaths in men under the age of 50. Among women under the age of 50, colon cancer is second only to breast cancer. Not so long ago, colon cancer ranked fourth in that age group. Why do you think more people are being diagnosed with colon cancer more now than a few years ago? 
This is a great question and um, a question we are getting all the time now. Um, the simple answer is we actually don't know. We don't know what's driving the uh, rise in young patients with colon cancer. There are a lot of um, research going on and uh, many uh, uh, things that are being studied. And a lot of these are the risk factors we traditionally know of colon cancer, such as tobacco, alcohol, diet related. We think there are changes uh, in gut microbiome that could have contributed, but what are the true drivers are still not very well understood. There are many studies now going on on early life exposure when the person was uh, in vitro, not even born, like what exposure mother had, and those kind of very, very early life exposures are also being studied. So we do not know for sure what's driving it. It's surely alarming. And that's why we have been asking everyone to be very aware of their symptoms, because that is one thing we have found that patients who have symptoms, we can detect hopefully cancer a little bit sooner. But what is driving the change, we are not really sure of. A lot of different factors. I guess it's hard to kind of pinpoint one. Yes, not one thing we know of why young patients are getting cancer. Genetics could explain up to 20 to 30 percent. It goes higher as the patient is younger. So even up to 30 percent of less than age 50 patients uh, could have a genetic mutation. So that could be contributing. But at 70 to 80 percent who are sporadic, we are not yet sure what's driving the change. It could be related to diet. Uh, it could be related to many changes that happened 40, 50 years ago. Um, but we are not uh, absolutely sure. Interesting. The screening age recommendation has recently dropped from 50 years to 45 with average risk. Why is this the case? And this is exactly the reason they dropped from 50 to 45. Uh, when this data started coming out that we are seeing younger patients less than age 50 with uh, colorectal cancer, that was one of the biggest driver for some of the biggest organization to come out and say we should start looking at screening even younger than age 50. And that's why it was dropped from 50 to 45. And we still are not capturing everyone, but this will tell us what has changed, at least between 45 to 50. Are we seeing more patients with uh, or similar number with cancer? And are we detecting a precancerous lesion at the same rate? So what are your thoughts on colonoscopies compared to at-home screening kits, such as Cologuard? Would you say that one is more effective than the other? So this is a great question. Colonoscopy is not the only option uh, to screen. We have various options, uh, such as you mentioned, at-home screening. Uh, but let me tell you about different options and what um, they entail. So at-home screening tests are stool tests. Um, and the two that are available um, are uh, fecal immunochemical testing, so FIT test and Cologuard, which is the multi-target stool DNA. And these tests are um, good for detection of uh, colon cancer, not as great for detection of precancerous colon polyp. As compared to colonoscopy, which is a direct visualization tool, so we uh, can take the scope and go in inside the colon and looking for polyps and cancer. So any of the stool tests, when they're positive, they have to go through the next step of colonoscopy. So th that's a, one of the biggest difference. Uh, in terms of being non-invasive at home versus invasive procedure. Colonoscopy also requires a prep, um, and that can be sometimes daunting, but there is no other way to see all uh, inside the colon uh, without you know, doing a good prep. So I would say that's one of the big difference. The other difference I would say is the screening interval. So like I mentioned, a colonoscopy, if you're average risk, if it's a good prep, uh, you don't need another one for 10 years. But the stool test, you do require more frequently, either every year, every two years, or every three years, such as in, in Cologuard. So you do require frequent screening, and um, it's not a great option for precancerous polyps all the time uh, compared to colonoscopies. So it sounds like nothing paints a clearer picture of someone's colon than actually doing a colonoscopy. Yes, that is the only way we can find polyps and cancer, and that's why if your stool test is positive, you still need a colonoscopy. However, if for some reason you don't want to get colonoscopy, 
uh, you should get some screening, which is stool test. It's highly recommended to do the at-home fit test because the office cancer detection uh, um, sensitivity that we must do some screening. And, you know, any screening is a good screening. So if you cannot get um, colonoscopy for some reason, you absolutely should consider a stool test. Well, that's good to know. It is a great backup option. Do you have any advice or tips for someone who is nervous about getting a colonoscopy? And do you have any best practices that someone should know before a procedure? Yeah, so I would say it's very normal to be nervous. You know, you're going through a colonoscopy as an invasive procedure, and it's it's normal to be nervous. But this is a very common procedure. It's a very safe procedure overall, and it's a very controlled procedure. It's done under in a very monitored environment. We have anesthesiologists. We have the whole team that takes uh, care of you. So uh, the worry of having an invasive procedure should be really minimal. The the things what people don't like about colonoscopy is doing the bowel prep. And that is, uh, you, you know, people talk about horror stories about it or joke about it. And I, I do see uh, it, it's it's not fun to do the bowel prep, but that's the most important part of the whole procedure because we want your colon to be really, really clean so that we don't miss polyps. These are precancerous growth that can turn into cancer. We want to avoid missing anything as much as we can and it seems daunting to do this, but if you just follow the process, it's not that bad. If you just follow the process, the prep has improved over the years. We do split prep, so you don't have to drink the whole volume in one go. There are options we can help you with. And there are also, um, at least in Mestar, there's contact information. If you have questions, if you need to talk to someone, if you have difficulty in prepping, you can actually call this number and talk to somebody to help you through the process. Oh, that's great that they have those uh, resources. How long does somebody have to fast? Yeah, so usually the fasting process starts the day before, but we say you can't eat solid. You can still have clear diet or a liquid diet, as we call, like, you know, see-through clear diet, but you can't have solid. Um, But the real fasting in some sense that you cannot have anything is from the midnight before, as we say, except the prep. So, this is something uh, that's been used in any surgical procedure, fasting. We don't want any food in your stomach uh, because it's, uh, it can aspirate and we don't want any uh, that kind of complication to happen. So there is uh, this fasting which needs to be done. But it may be a little longer than other procedure because you're holding solid, but you can still have liquid diet the day before. That's good to know. And I can see how it can be daunting for some people, but I think it's important to note that this isn't you know something that you have to do very frequently. You know, if, if, if you get your colonoscopy and the results are promising, you don't have to get one for a number of years afterwards. Is that correct? Please, Absolutely. Please correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a great point. I always tell uh, my patients about uh, why colonoscopy. And the great thing about colonoscopy is, even though it's invasive procedure, if you are average risk, and what I mean by that, you don't have family history of colon cancer, all of us, average risk patients have 5% risk of getting colon cancer. That's why we screen everyone at age 45. So if you are one of those who don't have any known family history, no symptoms, and you're starting your colonoscopy screening, if you have a great prep, which is what we are looking for, and we are confident we saw your colon very well, you're good for 10 years. You don't have to repeat it, do another screening for 10 years, unless until you have symptoms. Uh, So it's truly protective for that long um, and not worry about getting another screening test done in between. Wow, that is uh, really good to know. Thank you for adding that. Dr. Khan, you touched on this earlier, but can you explain the different stages of colon cancer and what are the treatment options available for them? Yes, so colon cancer, uh, like many uh, cancers, uh, starts with stage zero, say stage one to stage four, where earlier stages is still in the colon um, and then um, in situ, like it's just barely there. And then stage four, we are talking about it's gone beyond colon to other organs. So the options for treatment really depends on the stage. So the earliest stage is the easiest to treat, I would say, uh, because we can remove the colon. And essentially, you have a really good life expectancy. The five-year survival rate for stage one is more than 90%. Um, But it does diminish as the stage advances to up to stage four. And the whole idea is if we can find this cancer at the very earliest stage, you have the best prognosis. But 
I would say treatment for colon cancer has also improved over the years. We have better uh, medications, chemotherapies. We have more research studies going on in this area that has uh, helping prolonging life and also hopefully disease-free life. So the other thing I mentioned was about Lynch syndrome and Lynch syndrome being a different kind of cancer, there are other treatment options and actually very exciting treatment option in this area where we are seeing better results. So as time has progressed, we have better treatment, more research studies, and better tools for prevention as well. And I really hope this will expand even more in future. Dr. Kant, one of your specialties is regarding the prevention of colon cancer. What are some prevention measures we can take? Yeah, so there are many risk factors that have been studied in prevention of colon cancer. Many of these are very common ones, which are, say, avoiding smoking, tobacco usage, minimizing alcohol, increasing exercise, and just eating healthy. And when I say eating healthy, it means high, using high fiber in your diet, decreasing processed food or processed meat. Uh, there are um, enough data now saying processed uh, food could be um, changing gut microbiome and uh, if we can minimize that and increase more fiber in the diet, it could be helpful. So these uh, general uh, good practices are usually very beneficial uh, for, I would say, any cancer, but especially for colon cancer, we have data now to suggest these are helpful. The other thing I would add was, of course, screening prevention. So colon cancer can be prevented, and the recommendation is to start prevention by any of the options available, either by stool test or colonoscopy, by age 45. So everyone should consider screening. Why should someone choose MedStar Health for their colon cancer treatment or care? MedStar Health provides a multidisciplinary approach, which we need in any of the care for these patients. Colon cancer is complex. uh, So right from prevention to, say, if somebody develops cancer detection, to treatment, we have all the expertise available here. And I would say state-of-art expertise and also state-of-art care in terms of the best research possible or the best uh, evidence-based care one can get. We don't have to go beyond Mestar Health. We have everything in-house and we can communicate to each other and talk about it. And we do come together to talk about these patients in terms of treatment, pre-treatment, post-treatment, So I would say that's one of the uh, best uh, part of MedStar Health and having all the specialties come together and take care of the patient. That's a glowing review right there. What does the future of colon cancer care look like? And would you say there's reason for optimism? Yes. So like I mentioned, we are working towards better ways of preventing cancer and better ways of finding cure, better treatment uh, that could help patients live longer, even if they have cancer. So there's a lot going on in the world of uh, prevention and treatment, and I'm absolutely optimistic. But also research. We want to know about what's driving cancer. How can we change that? And the biggest thing I say is everyone around is talking about it, and that's the first step. Awareness is the first step that this is a problem, and how can we troubleshoot it and as a community and as everyone coming together. And that is the biggest uh, optimistic part of knowing about cancer and preventing cancer. Well said. It's definitely all about raising awareness. So we're so grateful for you taking time to let listeners know about this important information. I've been talking with Dr. Priyanka Kant at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital in Washington, D.C. Thank you for sharing your expertise with us today on MedStar Health Doc Talk. Thank you for having me here, and thank you for listening to me. To learn more about the colorectal cancer information we discussed during this podcast, go to medstarhealth.org slash cancer.